I'm embarrassed, folks. On the Mark Tribe, it's taken me so long to get Kevin Redfern on our On the Mark podcast. But there he is. Kevin, oh. welcome to our show. It's so good to have you. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Thank you for having me. Uh, look, ever since um, a former Columbus State golfer of mine, Aaron Kanth, gave me this wedge trainer and I fiddled with it, I was like, I've got to get this guy on the show because this little thing's genius. But before we go there, Kevin, I, I want you to tell our global audience a little bit about you, you know, how, where you came from, how you ended up where you are right now, because uh, I think the evolution of what you do and this little training aid is tremendous. Yeah. Um, I started as a hobby 40 years ago, making golf clubs. I just got interested um, and I just started to uh, take golf clubs to bits and reshaft in them. Uh, and then I got in touch with a company. They gave, uh, I bought some heads and shafts mm -hmm. and it went from there. And I just got interested in just helping people play better golf. Well, now you're one of the foremost minds in the industry. And as I look through your website, I'm seeing basically a who's who of golf turning to Kevin Redfern for not just golf instruction, but for golf club fitting and such as well. I mean, look, I guess the rise has been meteoric in a way, right? Yeah. No, I've been very lucky. Um, about, 20, oh, about 30 years ago, I started to do stuff on the ladies tour and traveled with them and helped the, the girls. Um, after that, uh, I started to... Uh, help out on the European Senior Tour, which then mm -hmm. uh, was the Legends Tour, uh, well, the Stashore, then they changed it to the Legends Tour. And I've been working for those, uh, with all the guys there for about, uh, about five years now. I guess then I need to ask the question, look, when a person takes up golf, I understand the hobby of tinkering with it because you and I are both um, experienced we advanced in years so we came from an era where there was whipping on drivers and wooden heads and inserts with screws in the faces and such um so i understand the the hobby of tinkering with clubs but the playing element of it kevin um tell me about the playing a little bit yeah well i, I started to obviously play with the uh, persimmon golf clubs right. uh, i got into a, a bit of a passion of taking them all to bits and really doing the sole plates and the faces and varnishing and painting them. Um, and, and, well, just got very passionate for doing, doing uh, the working on the clubs to start with. Well, i got to ask then, because I've got a, in a bag just off screen over here, I've got a couple Keyhole McGregors that are brown and a black Tony Penner head. Uh, of the old persimmons, what's your favorite, the brown or, brown or the blonde or the black? Um... I've always thought the black. Uh, well, I like to see the grain, uh, obviously in the brown and that, but the the black ones when they look nice and shiny, mm -hmm. uh, with the amount of the amount of paint that I used to put on them, and just to make them look good. There's a lot of work goes into that as well as the uh, the, the brown and the blondes. But yeah. They all look great. They're just a pleasure to use. Well, I guess I've got to ask you then. Uh, we're in the midst right now in 2023 of the big brouhaha about the golf ball rollback. Where do, you, where do you stand on that? You, you've you been in the game at all levels. You've seen the game at the highest level. Where where do you stand? Yeah, well, I think with the golf balls going back to how it used to be, I think uh, a lot of us are going to be struggling with, certainly with the distance. Uh -huh. I think it's a great idea um, because uh, it's going to make it more difficult, for the obviously, for the public, yeah. uh, especially the guys that have been hitting the ball out there a long way to reduce their distance. It's, that seems to be uh, the hardest point for everyone when we're talking about it now. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess then it makes Kevin uh, even more important because one of your areas of expertise is club fitting. Um, and look, I'm, I'm a golf teacher deep down and I often say to people, I'm like, just changing on your golf swing is the intellectually lazy way of improving. Now, well, we all can improve. But there are other ports of call that you can go before you start adjusting your swing. So, so talk a little bit about the value of club fitting, because I feel like it's an area that most golfers won't gravitate toward as they're looking for ways to improve their game. Yeah. Uh, well, there's so many different options out there now to what they used to be years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be just going back to the golf ball. If, when they change the golf ball, how much is that going to change with the equipment? Uh, with the launch angles of the drivers and yeah. the spinning of the ball. It's going to be very interesting. It could be a whole new world out there to do with golf. Yeah, um, with manufacturers, it's, it's going to be very interesting. Going back, oh, 
about six months ago, um, I, I had some found some Velata golf balls um, in the wrappers from years ago. And I found I was literally hitting a four iron where I would be hitting a seven iron just to try and get the same distance. And it was a massive difference. And so the way those things react, be- the way they spin is crazy too. I mean, they move through the air so much with a modern day golf ball. It flies so straight. Even uh, I know folks are laughing at me because certain folks bend the ball, but that old Bellata, it used to curve like it was out of control. Especially with the persimmon clubs as well. Yeah. So speak about the importance of club fitting, because uh, most folks, a lot of golfers, I hesitate to say, maybe even listen to the show a lot. Um, they want to get better, but they might be using clubs that aren't correct for them, or they're using yeah. clubs that just picked up in the garage. So speak to the importance of that element, please. Yeah, I think one of the biggest problems that I've come across is when people have um, been custom fitted, um, they've gone to the, the fitting centers and They've been fitted for a, might be a standard length of, of shaft, uh, of club length and a regular stiff shaft, whatever it is that's going to suit them. Mm-hmm. Um, but they then decided that they do they need a bigger grip, um, which okay. they're going from a, a standard to a mid-size to a jumbo grip. They're much heavier. So that reduces the swing weight so much. They've lost the feel um, and it complete, feels completely different to what they were fitted with. That's one of the big things that... Uh, people seem to have a problem with they don't they don't seem to the manufacturers don't re-swing the 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 golf club they don't do the swing weight they just keep it as a standard with a heavy grip in the interests of understanding because i'm big about that um the difference between the overall mass and the swing weight describe what that is to our audience because uh, I, I don't want to be the place where they're like okay i hear what kevin's saying but but what you know what is the swing weight is that what my club weighs or how does this play Oh, well, the swing weight is it's really, they talk about swing weight. It's really, um, it's the balance of a golf club. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and it's really about feel. That's the mm-hmm. most important thing with the golf club. If whether you've got a swing weight and it works out, it might be C9, it might be D4 on the swing weight scale, but it's what it feels as long as it feels good to the individual okay. and making sure that the clubs, no, I don't really use a three iron now, but from a three iron, say, down to a, a nine iron, pitching wedge might be a little bit heavier, uh, but making sure they're consistently balanced. So when, if you had your eyes shut and you had a four iron in your hand or you had a seven or you had a, a nine iron and you had your eyes shut, you wouldn't be able to really feel the difference, what, what club, one wouldn't feel heavier than the other. It's amazing to me. I mean, I remember a ways back, it pops to mind as you share that anecdote, I was chatting with Nick Felder, you know, who to me is one of the greatest technicians I think ever in the game. And he was misunderstood for being very technical. Where was the furthest thing from? He's very auditory, very feel based. And he, you could see him pick up clubs and sort of go, no, no, yes, no, as he was just feeling how it was responding to him. But then we talked about it too. And I said, so what about aesthetics? You know, just the way a club looks. And he goes, oh, yeah, absolutely. He goes, I could have the best feeling thing in the world, but if I set it down and it doesn't look right to me, there was very little chance that thing was going to make the bag for him. Yeah, no, that's correct. Yeah. Um, they Obviously, it's like everything. You, it's got to look good to the eye. Mm-hmm. Um, I always say if, if you're playing well, it doesn't matter what it looks like, but if you're not playing so well, if it's an ugly looking club, it looks even worse. Um, Let's do this. Um because you talked about swing weights and and I've talked with various club guys like yourself and and the one man I'll never forget him say he used to build clubs for Ben Hogan <laughs> all right and uh, he said to me when he was brand new and nervous he met Mr Hogan and Hogan picked up an iron and he held the club in front of him and he held the golf club head and he said 10% of the club and he pointed at the sole of the club and then he said 90% of the club and he put, pointed towards the shaft of the club and this has sort of become this particular designer's mantra. Um, I don't think people understand the value of shafts, really, as it pertains to getting the right one in the club for oneself. I'd love your commentary there. Yeah, the, the trouble um, with what happens, I believe, at the moment, what um, they keep getting fitted. We're all told you go lighter and lighter. The lighter shaft is better. It's mm-hmm. going to make you swing faster and hit the ball um even further yeah but what tends to happen is that the shafts in my opinion 
are getting too light for a lot of people, not everybody, um, but they think they've got to go lighter. Mm-hmm. And then once they go lighter, it makes a lot of time it doesn't balance up with the golf club. Once again, it makes the swing weight much lighter and they lose the feel of the whole golf club. Yeah. Um, and, often, and often when you've got a lighter shaft, perhaps the, the, the stiffer shaft actually doesn't play as stiff as the old heavier ones. Um, they might play on the sort of between regular and stiff or just on the firmer side. So you will, they think they're using the stiff shaft, but they're actually not. They're using maybe a firmer shaft or more towards regular because it's so light. Yeah, that's uncanny. I mean, people don't think about that. And if, you've, if you're listening on audio, you can see Kevin. He's got a golf club in his hand and you can almost see how he's extending and bending his arms. He's responding to the mass of the club in his hand. Kevin, what you say there is brilliant because... You know, me, even, you know, back in the day, I'd pick up a shaft and I'd look at the bottom of it and would say like S or R or whatever for the flex of the shaft. Um, and you say that the, the the weight of the shaft can make it play differently depending on what head it's in. That's, cra- that's, un- that's crazy. Yeah. Well, with most of the manufacturers, if you've got a, um, if you've got a, uh, whether it's in a driver shaft or whether it's in, a, in an iron shaft, um, it can when you've got the heavier shaft, there's more material there. Yeah. So what happens is with the more material makes the shaft stiffer. Mm-hmm. So when you've got a very lightweight shaft, um, you've got more flex. Normally comes out more flexible in the shaft and mm-hmm. more bending in it. Let's talk about the flexing of the shaft. Um, I don't think a lot of people pay attention to it, and they'd be like, "Well, I just use stiff shafts." Uh, yeah. You've now described that there's more to it in terms of the weight of the shaft. But just differentiate for me the difference in how these shafts would perform between maybe a, a, a lady shaft, a regular shaft, and then a stiff shaft. Just how they move, how they perform throughout the swing, please. Yeah, with, with a, um, a lady shaft or, or, or more for, so necessarily for a lady, but the more flexible shafts, mm-hmm. they, the, the twisting, the torsional stiffness um, is, is higher. So there's more twisting for the much slower swinger to help square the club face up. Um, or the club head up at, uh, at impact. Okay. Um, whereas when you've got a, t- a tour player shaft, um, it's the, t- like a tour X, which is tour stiff shaft, normally much heavier and much more stable in the tip because they're swinging, there's less twisting in the head. So the torsional stiffness is much, much tighter. When you hear the pros and the better golfers talking about a tighter dispersion, and normally because the torque, is it's much lower, so there's less twisting in towards the head. I'm glad you would describe that because people don't realize that the f- shaft just doesn't really bend. It twists from side to side, like clockwise and anti-clockwise as well. That's the torque you describe, right? Yeah. yeah. When you when you see it on the television and they show a, a, a club being, um, you know, ball being hit um, and they show it in slow motion, you know, the, the actual head itself it just twists. You can see it. Mm-hmm. Um, through impact when it's striking the ball it's amazing how much twisting there is so if you've got something that's not very stable um, the ball can obviously goes all directions so you lose the tightness of the dispersion yeah but i guess for the player that doesn't swing as fast having some of that twisting or the player that might hang the ball out to the weak side have some having some of that propensity for the toe to want to shut some is also not too bad a deal for the slicer of the golf ball correct that's right. Yes. Yeah. It, it's a case of uh, um, working, making sure they got the right tor- torsional stiffness as well as the flex. And um, there's different they, like, different shafts will counterbalance where there's more weight at the butt end of the shaft to try and help the golfer swing a little bit more, you know, a little bit faster, uh, as long as they can feel the head. Because sometimes, you know, it's a counterbalance is really like putting a heavier grip on, um, as long as you can feel the head. I love the way you keep talking about feeling the head. I remember back, you know, way, way, way back when I was playing, I always loved, I imagined the swing like a pendulum and I always loved to feel the mass of the head throughout the golf club. Um, It brings me to, again, along the shaft line, kick points, because I'm sure some of our listeners or viewers might have heard, all right, well, this has got a high kick point or a low kick point. Help them. What is that, Kevin? The kick point is actually you've got the flex of the shaft, uh-huh. um, but the kick point, in other words, where the shaft, where it, um, if it's you've got a low kick point shaft, um, you, you, what it's going to do is going to 
is going to help with a with a ball flight. So mm-hmm. you get he's got a like a high mid uh, a high launching shaft, a low launching shaft, and a and a mid launching shaft. Mm-hmm. So if you've got a very low kick point, so in other words, if it's bending more down the bottom here, it's yeah. more flexible, it's softer in the the tip section of the shaft. It's going to promote a higher ball flight. For someone mm-hmm. say like myself that hits the ball pretty high. I need a, a higher kick point, as they call it, which is much, which is really only about four inches in the shaft here. The high kick point doesn't mean it's the, the kick point is up the top. I can hear it. Um, so that keeps the ball much lower. So it's a much firmer tip shaft <laughs> to help promote that lower ball. Folks, it's actually quite simple to understand. Um, as you've been through this for 40 something years, now you've obviously got custom golf sticks. In terms of club fitting, what are some of the big mistakes you see? Like, let's say there's Mark who comes here to Kevin and you book a session and you start fitting me. And then you look at my clubs and I'm like, oh, my gosh, this guy does this as well. Are, are there mistakes that you see the lion's share of golfers make as it pertains to their set of irons? Yeah, a lot of um, to do with like the weight of the shaft, okay. because someone who's works out and there's a gentleman that works down the gym play, works out in the gym and then he gets fitted by with a much lighter shaft that's too light for him mm-hmm. um, he, it doesn't necessarily mean he's he, he needs a very heavy shaft but a lot of them do get fitted because i think the fitters believe and are, are told and told by the manufacturer it's going to make you swing faster yeah, exactly. so Definitely, a lot of the time, people definitely get fitted with the wrong weight of shaft. The speed is, I don't want to say the death of our game, but everyone wants to be faster. But, you know, sometimes it's done without the understanding, which is something I'm passionate about. I I want to ask you about lofts and lies. I find the loft thing curious because we're playing, well, as golf clubs have developed, it's a disease of diminishing loft. Clubs are becoming less and less lofted. So on the back end of the arrangement, they're building more and more lofted wedges. So it's crazy. Everything's losing loft, but then they're building extra clubs into the bag. What's your take on loft? Uh, yeah. yeah, the manufacturers would say that, as like you just said, they're just de-lofting all their irons. People are now, it's a, it's a way, of, in my opinion, it's a way of they're selling golf clubs to make you believe that your your um, seven iron now is going as far as your six iron and maybe even the five iron. Uh-huh. Um, and then, of course, you see your friends on a, a Sunday morning out there playing, and all of a sudden with his new set of clubs where you both hit the five iron, he's now hitting a, set, a seven iron, yes. and maybe a six iron. Mm-hmm. So you think they're much better clubs, but all it is is they just de-lofted them. And then how um, about the addition of the super lofted wedge, which I feel, maybe I'm showing my age here, I think it's taking shot making ability out of the game. I mean, I look at the greats back in the day, the Olathabals, the Severiana, Biasteroses and company. A 56 degree wedge was like a magic wand for them. But nowadays, to get the ball in yeah. the air, people are just buying more lofted wedges and then plugging holes with gap wedges. It's crazy. That's right. Yeah. This, the manufacturers seem to be just selling so many wedges now. It's just, it's ridiculous, really. As you quite rightly said, Sevy and that would use a, a 56 or 55 degree wedge and mm. he, he could open it up and we could do anything with it. Yeah. Um, the, people now think uh, the shots, they've got to keep changing their club, different loft to play certain shots where I, I'm certain they would be much better if they kept with that one club and tried to play different shots, little knockdown shots, little run-up shots and, and, and also the, like a high flop shot. Well, from the golf teaching point of view here, speaking with a club um, um, fitting expert, I feel like the player gets the 60 degree wedge and now even now 64s and beyond. And then that thing only goes a certain distance. So then they jack the ball way back in their stance, get their hands way out in front of the thing. So they're making it de-lofted. But then that leading edge is exposed like a knife. So now some club fitting guy goes, well, you need more bounce. And so the next thing, you, you're basically just cobbling on something that shouldn't be used in the vein that it's trying to be used on. Well, I had a customer come in only yesterday and he, and he had a 14 degree bounce on, the, on his club. And he was playing it 
off of his right, he was right-handed golfer, he was playing off of his right foot. Mm. And it, it would have just been, he was still digging the ground, into the ground. Yeah. Because it, the leading edge was still too tight, too sharp to the to the ground. There's only so uh, bounce you can build in. Talk to people, tell people what bounce is, because it's one of those golf jargony sort of terms that people hear and they talk about bounce. But then if you really quiz them, I don't think they really know what bounce actually is and how the sole of that lofted wedge works. Yeah. Well, it's always been known that bounce is your friend. Um, the bounce of the golf club is how much that leading edge, um, say, is off the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so that you've actually got the bounce of, of the golf club here. If less bounce, then you've got the back edge is flatter, so the, the leading edge is lower to the ground. Yeah. So, um, it's, it's, it's one of the biggest mistakes that people, they, they think they need less bounce, and then, of course, they start digging. They come in too steep rather than shallow, um, and they just dig into the ground and hit it fat. And then they try, because they keep hitting it fat, then they try and scoop the ball up into the air. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course they get risky and that's one of the reasons with the wedge trainer A wedge trainer um, yeah yeah come up with the wedge trainer and working with the pros for two years before it anyone in the public uh, got to see it um getting feedback from the pros what they liked about it what they didn't and then putting it all together after the two years after making prototypes and then come up with the uh, the finished product um and touch wood We've got about five or six of the all the tours now. Um, a lot of the players have all been using it and practicing with it. Um, still getting feedback from them as well. So I have one, and I'm I have one, and I'm going to talk about it after. Just one more question. Um, I love the way you've described how the wedge or club, in fact, interacts with the ground. But how we as players interact with the club is very important too. And you've spoken about the grip size, which is a big deal, and the grip weight. Um, but also the lie of the golf club. I don't think people realize yeah. how often they should be checking the lofts and the lies of the irons. I want you to talk about that and then also talk about how what a golfer might see if the shaft was too upright and then opposite how what they would see in the ball flight if the shaft was too flat. Yeah. Well, if, I've got a little device here. Can I just grab the device for you? Please go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kevin's just stepping off screen if you're watching, um, if you're listening on audio. You so can't do this on YouTube. Here he's back. He's quick. And what he has is something oh, I use all the time. It's a magnetic lie angle tool. I love that thing. That's right, yes. It's just to put on the face of the face of the golf club. Uh -huh. When when a golf club is too um is too upright for somebody yeah. or the club is too long, um, what happens is their heel will dig in the ground. Mm -hmm. Hence you can see where this magnetic lie angle it's Point. aiming to the left. Uh -huh. if, the, if the toe is digging in the ground, the, the ball will then go off to the right. So ideally, to do a proper loft and lie, we want the score lines here to be parallel with the ground through impact. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you might stand at a dress. I've got golfers, even pros, that will stand at the dress and the heel will be um, like touching the ground and the toe is way up in the air. Exactly. Through impact, they actually come, might be square or the toe might be in the ground. So it, it needs to be adjusted so that the score lines come parallel with the ground. Hence, the ball will come go straight off the club face. Well, you've talked about the directional impact of a club that's badly set up lie-wise. Um, what about a miss strike toe or heel that a golfer may see if they're tinning one way or the other? Is there a trend like that? Yes, yeah. Um, it, normally, if the toe is digging in the ground, it will. Um, it certainly needs to be more up. It, it tends to be. It will need to be more upright. Mm -hmm. um, if you just keep seeing where they're marking um, on the face of the golf club where the ball strike, um, so that does give a good indication. But I would say that most of the public, if you're playing once a week, uh, maybe twice a week, it's worth getting them done every sort of like nine months to get them loft and lie properly. If you're playing at least two to three times, wow. I would always recommend about every six months to go somewhere where they've got a loft lie machine. Um, if you know what's right for you, take that along. They can put it in the machine and make the adjustment. Or if you're not sure, then get the with the club fitter, or club maker, get them to make sure um, that you're hitting balls and, you, and then they can make the correct adjustments for you. 
Bugs. and that is so important. You can have the you can have the best set of golf clubs, the right flex, the right length, the right weight, the right you know, grip thickness. Everything is great, but if you don't get that loft and lie angle correct for the lie angles, then you you're going to be struggling. Well, you're trying to you're trying to push. This something. happens all the time. Yeah, and you're trying to push. Um, every, every tournament. Sorry. No, no. I was, I was no every, every, every literally every. Oh, sorry, I lost you then. Yeah, go ahead. You were you were about to say because I was going to say oh. there too that if you're playing with incorrect lofts and lies, um, you're going to have to start manipulating through contact to get the desired ball flat. I don't care what skill station you're at. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And often what people do do, they go off, they go and have a lesson to um, to correct that one or two clubs because they keep pulling it or pushing it. Um, then the, the coach, it will get them to st get them hit the ball well. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they're not hitting the other clubs as good. Mm. <laughs> so it, yeah, it, it makes you do need to get them sorted out if you're not sure. Um, and it's, it's two things. Do you get your club sorted out or do you have a lesson? Um, and the good thing is I'm very lucky that I work with lots of pros um, that know um, to send them to me, the, the golfer, or I work with the pro and the golfer, watching them hitting balls and then make the adjustments. So you're working with the three of you, you know, the three of us. Uh, so, yeah, that is that is so important. Well, it's a relationship that me getting to work at the highest level, watching the best do it all the very best they do this all the time and then the rest of us we don't uh have that luxury or certainly employ that luxury and so as a result we're almost spinning our wheels at times i also want to highlight too because you probably see it uh, and we'll we'll pivot to the wedge trainer um golfers hitting lots of wedges with range balls the face yes. wear down very fast yeah yes and, and i'm sure you would be an advocate of wiping off the face and the golf ball before you practice with a thing because they can chew up wedge faces very very fast yeah yeah no definitely and often if the balls they're not clean obviously when you're playing golf um they make the golf balls aren't always clean but when you're four hitting 50 golf balls or 100 golf balls at the driving range they've all got grit or sand on them then mm -hmm. yeah it's going to mark to certainly mark the uh the face of your golf club awesome okay now while we're on the wedges i have my wedge trainer in front of me for the audio listeners it's this nifty, very portable little aid that comes in a bag. You can keep it in your golf bag. It attaches to the top of the wedge. And then it's got a golf ball on the end of it. And it's basically lodges um, just against your forearm, your lead forearm. And Kevin, the first time I ever practiced with it and hit a few shots, I felt like Steve Stricker looks. I mean, it, it was so cool how it eliminated any excess hand action. So I want you to talk about the inspiration for this thing, how it came about. Oh, well, for years, I've had so many people come in to me asking me to grind down their wedges or, because they're not getting a good contact with the ball mm -hmm. um, and a good strike. So I thought, right, it needs to be something um, that is going to benefit pros, beginners, children, everyone to do with golf yeah. um, and, and the club golfers. So I needed something because there's there were never there wasn't any training aids out there really to do much with with wedges, and also to put on different clubs, different wedges. So if you had a 50 or 52 and you wanted to put it on a 56, rather than buying the individual club with a training aid fixed to it, mm -hmm. the wedge trainer have made it so that it can be attached to any of your golf clubs. Yeah. So that was that was the beauty of this this tool here. When I use it. Like you were talking about the bounce and how, you know, with the ball back in the stance, it exposes too much front edge and the club digs too much or vice versa. When I used this thing, because of how it isolated wrist movement, I felt like there was almost no way, and I know that's a big statement, that I couldn't apply the club face appropriately to the ball and even have the face operate through the base of the arc and interact with the ground very, very consistently. Consistently, is is that what kind of the inspiration for you was? With with what is so well, watching Steve Stricker and Jason Day, how simple they kept it for that dead arm yeah. without wrist break, um, and that's one of the biggest problems that the public and, and uh, that have. They come in and they start chopping down at the ball coming in too steep, and and 
or when they get through the ball, they start flicking it, breaking their wrists. Where the wedge trainer, with putting it against your wrist, um, it, it, when you take the club back and it shallows, it shallows the uh, the club head going through impact, um, and it's it feels so very it, much. It feels very much like a pendulum kind of an action. Um, yeah. as I've swung it. Is is that your vision for how it should operate? Yeah, it just it just um, there's less chance for error trying to. You know, obviously, it's not for every golf shot, every um, wedge shot that you need to play, lob shots and things. But it just eliminates so many problems that golfers that we do get. <laughs> you know, yeah. Mainly, as I say, with coming down too steep and flicking the wrists. I heard a golfer say to me, and I paraphrase, I put it on a club and they had a try. Very wristy, sort of a chipper. Good when they were good, uh, inconsistent when they weren't on. Or when they were on uneven lies, they struggled because the base of the arc was a miss, as you can imagine. And so I put it on, and the golfer's response to me after hitting four or five balls was like, man, I feel like I've got to pivot and use my body, my torso better. I can't cheat here and just kind of throw my wrist in the club at the ball. And I was like, yeah, because there is that relationship between how your wrist move and how your body has to support or vice versa, your take. Well, what we found, it, first of all, with the pros using it, mm -hmm. what they did, they obviously they, they had a narrower stance, mm -hmm. um, but their leading, their leading foot, uh, if you're a right-handed golfer, it was their left foot. Most of them opened it up slightly, and we're taking, they're just taking the club back and going through. What it done, it turned your body, um, the major, um, your buckle faced the target and allowed you to get through the ball so much easier. Yeah. Uh, with with your, and it made, with your right with your right arm, it stopped you bending it and turning over, um, and it maintains the loft of the club face. So yeah. it was facing, it was facing up in the air rather than twisting the club face over. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm a big I'm a big fan of a golf good, good, good training aid. There, there are a few criteria that I always look for. One is it portable. Two, um, can you make can you hit balls with it? I don't like well I like yep. aids, but I don't like aids that you just practice with and then you go and try and replicate the feel. And then I love a training aid that's not screw upable, <laughs> okay, because it's easy to use. Because um, look, none of us we ever going to read the manual or the directions. But seeing as I have the expert and the inventor of the wedge trainer, Kevin Redfern on the show with us, describe people how it's used, how you affix it to the club, how you use it, um, and if you can use it with more than a wedge, please. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, what, um, it, we just decided that I was going to make it to work for a wedge. Okay. But a really good thing to do would be put it on a um, an eight iron or even a six iron and use it around the greens um, to just to run it up. If you're on the fringe and you can't putt through the fringe, is to put it on there and practice with that first of all and just put it onto the gold club and I'll explain that in a minute and just play it like a putting motion right. and it just works so good and then try it from say from a six iron and then try it with a seven iron and an eight iron. Get the feel and see what the ball actually does and how it how it performs off the club face yeah. and you'll be absolutely amazed how straight it goes and then once you get to the wedges um, to put it on if you, it's just unscrewed here it takes off and it goes onto the top of the club face uh, onto the cut on top of the grip mm -hmm. and then line piece the bar here just to start with to line the bar in line with the face all right. You can open, once you play around with it, you can open the club face and put it on and screw it on. So first of all, if you just put it on, and even if you had the club face at just one o'clock, and having the the, uh, the wedge trainer on square, and then you just put it on, tighten it, yeah, tighten it up. Once it's tight, once you just tighten that up, it doesn't have to be mega tight, but once you just tied that on there, you can't move. So if you've got it on and you wanted to change the angle, you just undo the little screw here, turn it, and then do it up. Okay. And then um, because we what we've done when we're having it made, so it can't move. Yeah. So you can't slide it round. And then by having 
uh, the, the power on your arm here is to literally keep it on there and just take it back and follow through. And the, what is a, what it really does as well, it, it help it makes you turn through the ball, mm -hmm. but with your left shoulder, what it tends to do, it stops doing stop going it. hard. Yeah, stop the tilt. Stops it and it stops that tilt. What it does, it makes you turn through the ball. <laughs> keeps this left shoulder actually a bit lower. Yeah. So and it's to make it turn. If you if you go on to uh, um, our Instagram and, and see the different players that are using that, the tour players even, they're turning through the ball. Um, and it's none of this scooping or leaning back. So yeah. it, work, it works a treat. Guarantee, absolutely guaranteed to help with contact if you've got the ball position correct. Um, and as folks who are listening, as Kevin said it on the wedge, he'd have the steel bar just on the inside of his uh, front forearm. And then there's a golf ball on the end of it, just almost like a reference too, which I think is a nice visual because you, you know, you're keeping your eye on the ball, you're striking, but you almost get a sense, I did, at least in my periphery, where you could see the ball on the end of the wedge trainer just arcing back and forth as the body was moving appropriately. So it, it'll iron out any sort of swing directional impetus as well because you can sort of go, well, that looks a bit crooked in my periphery. So it really helps to neaten everything up. And it's simple. That's how it's that simple yet can cure all sorts of greenside swing ales. When we one thing, if um, some a lot of the pros, um, when they have used it, they got a little bit of they want a little bit of wrist movement just on the backswing, just a fraction. Yeah. So what we've done is recommended is when they put the way, get the club face pointing uh, or aiming to where they want to it to go and then put the wedge trainer and maybe with a with the bar here sort of one finger width Left just in there up. so yeah. that they can go they've got just that little bit, just that little bit of hinge there but keep it on through impact and then that will maintain like a straighter arm here going through impact with the club face aiming at the, at the sky in summary golfers if you've been accused of flipping scooping Anything that fits in with those ing descriptors on how your wrists or club move through the ball, the wedge trainer is a must for you. Hey, uh, Kevin, it's incredible. Um, how do folks get a wedge trainer? Where do they go, please? Um, they can go on the website, um, and it's the wedgetrainer.com. They mm -hmm. can order it online on there. Um, that, that's, the, that's the best place to go if they want more information how to uh, obviously you can it tells us on the website how to use it um on instagram there's uh, videos on there that people have actually put on there and can't even pros have uh, brought them and, and sent videos so nobody's been paid or anything uh, to promote the product for us they've all done it off the back because they believed in the product Kevin, I wouldn't be featuring it to my global audience if I didn't believe in this thing also. When it came to me the first time from Aaron, I'll never forget the day he took it out of his bag. He goes, uh, a coach of mine, a good friend of mine, Kevin sent this to me. He wants you to try it. So I was like, interesting. So I put on a club that afternoon and I was like, golly. I mean, kept my front wrist stable throughout the action. It felt like it widened my swing arc. Like I say, it felt like it made me pivot and move my body more in support of my wrist allowing my wrist to go rogue on me and and then i was like goodness gracious me i can't believe anyone hasn't thought about something that's smart before now i'm sure there are variations thereof but i love its portability i love its weight i love its ease of use and how it does stay stable on the club because variations i've seen before they do tend tend to want to twist around the place yeah, but we worked hard with the pros, trying to get making sure that they were a hundred percent happy, and obviously they're swinging a little bit faster and firmer, uh, you know, trying to hit the ball um, without it moving. So that that was the main that was the main object, just to make sure it was right for them. So when the public got it, it was going to be good for everybody. It is good for you, folks. Go check out wedgetrainer.com. Okay, if they want to follow you and get more of your insights, where do they go to find you, please, Kevin? Uh, well, that's for customgolfsticks.com. All right. And I'm sure you're on social media somewhere, correct? Yes. Um, I'm at, on Instagram as well as Custom Golf Sticks. Kevin, I appreciate you very much. I think this is tremendous. And and you do such important work with club fitting and advising young golfers. So thanks for what you do. And thanks for reaching out to us. I really appreciate you. 
Thank you very much indeed. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.